Hello everybody, uh, it's Tuesdays with Tony again, although it's Friday, uh, and uh, this is our fifth episode. Again, I want to uh, you tell you folks that, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting for uh, lots of questions, and we'd like for this be to eventually become a forum. We're always going to have guests. Our guest today is Bill Fanning, great trumpet player, and we, uh, he's got a lot to talk about. But uh, the one question that we've been, that's been coming up, uh, is uh, about oh, this overtone business that we do on the saxophone. We did it last week with Mark Weissman in the first interview with Arnie. We, they talked about their warm-up and how they they deal with these overtones. And it's, it is very confusing uh, at first. But overtones are, in all of music, you know, every instrument, this, you know, this, this overtone series that exists. Uh, it, it is basically, the, it's the root and then another, and then an octave above that, and then a third above that, and then an octave above that. No, wait a minute. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's root, octave, fifth, octave, third. That's all we're going to use for saxophone. So, um, so the deal is, you know, you need a proper armature. Proper armature being, uh, you know, as loose as possible. Uh, you know, um, as little lower lip as possible, jaw in the right position. So the jaw would be uh, a real relaxed position. Uh, Joe Ella used to talk about saying X, and when you say X, you're, you know, you, all your stuff is working properly. Your jaw's dropping the way it's supposed to drop or rising or whatever it may be. So um, what else? I'm trying to, I'm gonna look at my notes. Yeah, totally relaxed. Um, your bottom lip, uh, you take you, you want to take it as little lower lip as you can. Um, I talk about a textbook uh, armature to, to my my uh, my students, and that would be just a normal face position, like sort of totally relaxed, like you're sleeping. You take it as little lower lip as you can, and and you uh, you go from there. So you go. <laughs> camera can see but uh, again I, I talk about um, you know if I was going to take a photograph of you to go in my book the photograph would be totally relaxed with as little lower lip as possible so like this all right and then what most people want to do is when they start to play if this was the mouth and this is the chops and here's the mouthpiece you want that we go like this. Can you see that? <laughs> okay. So you don't want to. You want to stay away from that. Okay. So uh, bottom lip. That's the bottom lip. Um, top lip does nothing. The top lip is just totally relaxed. I'm going to show you something. I, I think I can get you. See if you can get me in to this. This is another Joe Aller thing. I'm gonna play a note, and I'm gonna take my top lip. And see how I talk to you? See, I don't need my top lip. Okay, so as little lower lip as possible. Relax as much as you can. You know, uh, the, the pressure from the, the pressure that you need to play the, the instrument and to, to come up against the reed comes from the bottom teeth. So you don't want the bottom teeth to touch the reed, but your bottom lip is to the bottom teeth what the, what the cushion on the hammer of a piano is to, is to the hammer. So, so therefore, you don't want to bring any muscles into, the only muscles you're going to use is to keep the air from escaping. And then you'll get the overtones. So how do you get the overtones? So you play, you finger a low note, a C is a perfect note, and you start, and you, you sort of start, it's best to start on middle C. So most young players, when they try to play a low C, get the middle C, like this. See, I'm fingering low C. But if, if, I, if I change my, what's happening in my larynx, which is that A, E, which is what happens when you, you use vowel sounds, it's the, the larynx is in there, right? So, so A is most open, so and E is less open. So, that's the key. The key is to is to change those vowel sounds. So I'm going to start on the middle one. I'm going to change. I'm not going to change my chops at all. 
I'm just going, ah, essentially. Let me keep going, and then I, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna go talk to, to uh, Bill. <laughs> It's when I play a G, and here's the real G, and here's the larynx, the, the low C G. Well, I'm doing the same thing here, you know, and so is, are all you younger saxophone players or older saxophone players who don't do this. You're, you're changing, but this is a more scientific way of, of changing. You learn, or a more learned way of changing by trying this exercise. The last thing I'm going to say about this whole thing is I found after years of teaching that I, you, you, you tell a student about it, you get them all set to go, and they can't do it. Or else they could, some of them can do it the first day, young little people, you know, because they don't have that habit of biting and chewing. The chewing, the, the chewing is what messes you up. So try this, try this at home. Um, and um, again, the way it usually works is, is, um, it, is you can't get it, you can't get it, you can't get it, and you want to give up, and then all of a sudden you get it. And what you get is you get the feeling of the change of this vowel thing. Okay? So hopefully that was, was cool. <laughs> so now we're going to go see Bill Fanning. So follow me, okay? And I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Here he is. Bill Finn. Yes. Hello, Bill Finn. Hello. 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 How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, yeah. so good, Tony? I'm good. With you. <laughs> so, uh, so Bill and I have known each other for, for a lot of long time, 20 yeah. years, playing the band. We played in Eric French's big band. Where, uh, where I, I, that's where I met uh, uh, Mark Weisman as well. We did, Mark, we did Mark Weisman last week. I don't know if you remember that. No. That was really good. That's um, what it was. So, uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, your history, man. Yeah. Like, you know, where you, where'd you, where'd you grow up? You grew up in I Auburn. grew up in Auburn, yeah. I grew up in Auburn, and um, I went to Westfield State College, and um, then uh, later on in life I went to New England Conservatory. But uh, I grew up in Auburn, and I used to go see uh, Emil Haddad. Uh-huh, there he is. And Emil Dick Haddad. Audrin. And they were uh, serious inspirations in my life, uh, musically. And, um, you know, they were gracious enough to let me sit in and and learn some things, you know. And I started on trumpet in uh, fifth grade, fourth grade maybe, with a uh, gentleman by the name of Milton Patterson. He's no longer with us, but uh, he was a great teacher, you know. Yeah. Started many Auburn's books, so. Yeah. You know, I just kept following uh, what it is I wanted to do to this point, and here I am with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he, evil, man, was this great. guy was great, and he, he like, yeah. he, uh, he lived on fifty. Yeah, he actually lived on fifty fifty second Street. I think. Yeah, he's, he's got he's he got some history. With, yeah, he's got major major history. He's yeah, yeah. Like bird. He yeah. played his. He's played so wonderfully and so yep. beautifully, and and was yeah. a total ear guy, right? Uh, you know, I used to go over his house and uh, have coffee with him on. Uh, I think it was Wednesdays, you know, and I would always try to learn something from him, you know, and um, so you know to get geeky with them, I said one time, you know, because we're always trying to learn, right. <laughs> especially at that age. All right, how would you approach an E7? You're playing a tune, you know, and here comes E7. Are you thinking anything? And he says to me, he says, I don't know what E7 is. You know, I'm thinking, what? He doesn't know what E7 is. And then he goes over to the piano and he says, but Dick Audrin played this last night, and he plays this riff. And I went, wait a minute. <laughs> you remember what he played last night? You're playing it for me today on the piano. And then when he, he would scat sing, I could see his fingers would be moving over here. So what he was doing was he was singing and playing the trumpet at the same time. Everything he did was music. You know, it went from the brain to the fingers and out the end of the horn. And even when he was scat singing, like I said, his fingers were moving. It was just pure music all the time. That was a huge influence yeah. on me, you know. 
uh, because everything, obviously everything he played was so beautiful and melodic. It was just totally. pure music, yeah. you know? So that struck me deeply. Well, that's yeah. interesting because we were talking earlier about Bobby Shue, what Bobby yeah. Shue told you Study about. Bobby Shue, yeah, yeah. And, Bobby and Bill studied you know, with Bobby Shue. Yeah, and he's come, you know, same kind of mold, you know, everything that he plays is pure music, you know, and he would always warn me about, you know, make sure you're playing music. Yeah. <laughs> he's a big proponent of playing music. And tell me the story about, he said about the trans transposing, like cats would transpose your stuff and... The, and oh, well, this, uh, somebody in the audience, a vocalist who's going to transcribe what you play and put words to it. So we have analogies like this, you know, which really gets you thinking. You it know? does, yeah. When you start, yeah, 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 when you're going all over the place. And right. then I studied for a period of time with Bob Brookmeyer in New England Conservatory, and it was wonderful. We would just trade apes. So I'm valve trombone and I'm playing my horn, you know. And I'd be playing right in the middle of something, he'd just grab me and say, Stop! Why are you playing that? Well, because I've been working on this lick for it. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear what you've been working on. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that made me really take just a step back. It. And then you had to really get into the moment, listen to what you were playing, have no preconceived idea about it. You know, play a phrase, develop it, or just rest develop that so now everything's starting to be connected and you can tell how Brookmeyer played yeah that's how Emo played yeah you know I believe that's how Shu played you know all yeah. the guys that I really you know enjoy listening to like Chuck Baker and I believe Miles Davis and, and even Clifford Brown at the time I remember Clifford Brown was really my very first influence mm. uh, I remember when somebody played that for me and they said you know this is he's improvising and I'm thinking this is not written down he's making this up on the spot and I thought I could just feel this weight lift off me. It was like, wow, I don't have to worry about that E flat in the Haydn trumpet concerto anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, people waiting for you to miss that note. Yeah. And now it was like jazz, you could just, you know, if you wanted to play the high E flat, fine, but if you didn't, don't. <laughs> you know, but everything Clifford played, I believe, was very melodic too. And, uh, I transcribed a ton of Clifford Brown stuff because I wanted to play like Clifford Brown. Yeah. And then when I realized I couldn't do that, <laughs> you know, somebody hit me to a long time ago, uh, but I never really paid much attention to him um, for a while, was Tom Harrell. Now he's my guy. Yeah. Know. You know, and so um, I transcribed a mountain of Tom Harrell stuff, wanting to play like Tom Harrell, and couldn't do that either. <laughs> so, you know, it was along the lines in this journey, you start to realize you, know, you have to play Bill Fanning. Yeah. And, uh, you have to play Tony. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? I, and, and that's just my opinion on it, but that's really where I enjoy now, is I enjoy taking a solo um, and trying to create a story with it, tell a story. Everything's connected. I mean, ideally, the perfect solo for me is everything's connected. There's a peak, you come out of it, you know, and it's right. all, it's all it's a melody. composition, it's a melody. story. It's all about, me I mean, it's melody, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I talked to, to one of my friends recently about, like, melody, that, that's melodies and everything. And it's yeah. like, you know, you know, Beethoven and Mozart, they made these melodies, they were, and they were mm. usually very simple melodies. Beethoven's nine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, in, in the reality, where does, so where does that melody come from, man? I mean, when, yeah. You know, I, right? it's, I, I think it's vocal. I mean, I could be wrong, it's just what I think, but I think things are vocal. Again, back to that transcribe, you know, put words to it type, yeah, type yeah. thing, you know, I mean. Interesting. That's, that's one way to look I used to teach, it. you know, I used to, to teach kids and say, you know, read, read out of a book, you yeah. know, and make music out of yeah. it. So you read a story, yeah. and it's kind of, nah, I haven't thought of that one. Well, you know, uh, we go out, I go out with Jeff Coffin, and, and we do clinics, and he'll play, I probably shouldn't give the answer away, but he'll play the stars, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Pledge of Allegiance on the saxophone. You know, oh, and he'll yeah, tell the oh, crowd. Yeah, yeah, he'll tell yeah. the crowd, you know what I'm about to play, and then he'll play it. He's got a melody for it, but and then you know, and, oh, and, and he'll send his th breath involved. Too, then he'll right? say, then he'll say to him, you know, how many people know what it is? He hasn't told them what it is yet. Nobody raises their hand. He goes, I'll do it again, and he plays it again, and nobody raises his hand. Then right. he says, different notes, different notes. No, 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 right? same exact notes. Oh, then he says, this is the Pledge of Allegiance, and once he plays it, everybody hears nah, it. You know? that's so it's the same thing. That yeah, was yeah. kind of like a, a, a technique uh, he uses. We use in, in our clinics is, um, like I'm talking to you, play what I say to you. Right. Yeah. Right. All the <laughs> you know? right. All the inflection. Right. All the inflection. Yeah, yeah, articulation. Yeah. So it's vocal, you that's know. Really cool. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, let me, let me go to my notes here. Sure, man. I don't sure. miss anything. Uh, or gear. You want, you, want, you want to talk about gear? Yeah, I play, I play a, uh, the, uh, the Bobby Shue Yamaha flugelhorn, and I play the Custom Z Bobby Shue uh, trumpet. Oh, is that the flugelhorn that's out the same flugelhorn? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's behind you, in that case right there oh. behind you. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, you want to yeah. 
did you spray a fugu? It's not ground my fugu on it, but again, it's the Bobby Shoe model fugu on it. Oh, yeah. And the sound of it is um, very close to a Queen on sound, which is the, the standard fugu on sound, you know, yeah. uh, beautiful. That's not the one Fugu on one. sound. No, no, no. You know, it's a beautiful fugu on sound. It used to be the fugu on that all cats would use. Okay. And, uh, Anyway, that's the sound that I want is patented after the old Queen Ons. I remember, uh, you know, being a, uh, I hope I don't embarrass you with this, but, but uh, you know, getting on Eric's band, getting on that band, and, and uh, you know, you, you know you're, you're new in a band, there's all these guys, and they're all behind you because I'm a saxophone player. They're yeah, all yeah. Behind you, you know? And I remember you taking a flume on so like it was it was a head turner, you know, it was like, well, who's that guy? <laughs> so, yeah. And when is he leaving? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So mouthpiece you play? Uh, uh, well, no, actually, oh, so I used the shoe mouthpiece with the flugel on, but now on the trumpet I'm using a Steve Patrick mouthpiece. Steve Patrick is a wonderful uh, top call uh, session player in Nashville, Tennessee. We were in a band together when I was in Nashville. He has a... Uh, his own mouthpiece line now. Yeah. And uh, I love him. I yeah. love those mouthpieces, you know. Yeah. yeah, so I use his now. Mm -hmm. So uh, next, uh, you know, if, if you could sort of go over what, uh, you know, what you, some te teaching techniques. I mean, I, I, you, well, when I teach, um, if I get a new student, the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'll ask him to play so I see what he does. You know, and then um, some, the techniques I, I teach those kids, or anyone really, adults as well, is what I learned from Shu, which you, exactly what he did to me, I do to them, you know, so, you right, know right. which is a good kick in the pants, really. Yeah. And um, it usually comes down to, the first thing we got to do is you got to learn to breathe. It's a wind instrument. It requires you to move air through the horn. So you have to think about intake of air and then pushing air through the horn, your body has to become an air compressor. And I, you know, talk about how to do this, you know, because my whole life people would tell me, you know, hey, you know, you've got to move the air, breathe, breathe from the diaphragm, but no one ever showed me how. You know, they would just say, you know, you breathe from your diaphragm. Yeah. Well, obviously from being fortunate enough to study with Bobby Shu, I learned how to teach this as well as do it myself. So, so could you no, 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 I no. can't, I can't so, show so, because so. I'll lose my students. <laughs> <laughs> they won't have to come to me anymore. No, no, it's a yoga breath, and you breathe deep. Oh, the three you know, it's a three-part breath. Exactly, yeah. it's a three-part breath. You bring your, you know, your stomach back towards your spine. Roger Ingram likes to describe it as pinning your belly button to your spine, so you create a wedge in yourself. And now you, you know, you use the air as you need it. You know, it's compressed, and you don't relax your stomach area until you're done playing. You yeah. know, and take the next breath. You know, yeah. so ultimately, there's so much. About, yeah, it's you know, there's so many different ways of. Conceiving it, you know, like yeah. which is all what it's all about. I just took a lesson just last week with a flute play, uh, player who ta talked about the belly. You mm -hmm. know how the belly has to go out. Like mm -hmm. that was his whole stick. He mm -hmm. said, "Take a breath." And of course, mm -hmm. I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, but, everybody has their technique of you know. And, and Shu tells me he learned it because he was on a band. It was Buddy's band, and he was forced into the lead chair, and he wasn't really. You know, breathing that way, playing that way. He's, and he was like telling Buddy, I'm not really. He goes, I want you play lead. So he said it was all bloody. He had hot press, ice in between tunes, oh. blood and everything. So he learned to breathe, you know, uh, learned his wedge breath from Maynard. Yeah, right. And Maynard, so, Maynard was a big, you know, there's a lot of, guy, right? Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of misconceptions about a lot of different things out there. And one of them is never lift your shoulders. Well, the first thing he said to me was, you got to lift your shoulders. You oh, go, really? And you can okay. feel the air rush up to the upper part of the lung. The thing is, is, you can't leave your shoulders like this. You have to relax the shoulders, and everything has to be tight here. Now you've got this immense pocket of air that you can compress to push through the horn. Students. So, you know, if i got really young kids, I don't go in that great detail about that. Right. You know, but it does start with the breath. Well, that's and I your shoulders go up, huh? So take it. Well, not, so the, the kids, when I show them this, you know... Um, if they're struggling, like if they're new kids, they get the magic five notes, C to G, right? Right. So, you know, and they're struggling to get the G. It's a third or fourth lesson, you know what I mean? And I show them, no, push like you're blowing out a candle. Make them pay attention to blowing out a candle way across the room. Where do you feel that? So ultimately, they'll say, in my stomach. When you go for the G, you're blowing out a candle. Boom, they get the G every time. Yeah. The problem is i got to teach that lesson every week. <laughs> I keep forgetting. <laughs> you know? But anyway, it starts with a breath. That's yeah. where I start. And then depending on the, the student and where they want to go from there, you know, we'll dig into it. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's where it started with me. I'll never forget. I was, you know, I was in a Navy band in San Diego. I was, quote, working professionally. And I went up there for my first lesson. 
that's a story in itself. I got Bobby Shue's number from Mr. Emil Haddad, and I called him when I got stationed in San Diego. Make sure you call Bobby Shue. I called Bobby Shue, and he's like, he was very busy traveling all the time. He still does, but back then, this is the 80s, he was traveling a lot. He's like, well, I got to do this. I'm going to New Zealand. I'm going to go I said, well, Mr. Shue, I got your number from Emil Haddad. He goes, you'll be here Monday. Oh, that's Honest nice. to God, the door oh, just went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I went up there, and uh, I forgot where I was going before I went there. But anyway, that's how I got into see Shue. Yeah. yeah. That's great. You I go know, back and listen to the tape, you'll say, this is where you meant to go. <laughs> I'm having a moment right there. More coffee. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, cool. All right, so, uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to show something? This is the Fluble one. I, I, I shouldn't be, I just, for some reason, I haven't played it all today. But, that itself is another lesson. All right, so, for each note as you ascend the scale, the air is going to move a little bit faster. The faster the air, the higher the note, okay? So I don't claim to be a screamer, but I'll tell you, with the air support, now I'm back on track, your pitch stays where it should. Your endurance goes uh, skyrockets because now you're taking all the pressure off your lips and you're putting it down here. Not all of it, but most of it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then if, depending on how you keep your lips, if you pucker them forward or smile, two different techniques, you, you know, your endurance can take off too. If you pucker forward, you've got more muscle between your teeth and the mouthpiece, which causes more of a cushion. You know, so that should help with your endurance too. It's all related to breathing. So, I'm going to do it sitting down, but, so. Yeah, the first note of the day. So I'm going. By the time I get to the app, so everything's in the breath. Guess what? It's muscle memory after a while. Now, your consistency is through the roof, all right? And it's all related to the breath. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And if you know, and you get, you, you, I had to work for a while. He told me to stand in front of a mirror without your shirt on so you could see the muscles working. And I did it, you know? I, I, I actually did everything he told me to do. Yeah. Which you have a hard time getting kids to do, uh, yeah. you know? I mean, because they weren't, at that point, I was already working professionally. And the Navy band as a trumpet player. There we go. I'm back on track. <laughs> so that very first lesson, right? He was brutally honest with me. I played. And he wanted to see what I did. So I did it. And he looked at me and he said, well, lesson one is you need to learn to play the trumpet. Wait, what? <laughs> you know? It was, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was crushed a little bit. Sure. But, you know, it? I could have thrown my hands up in the air and say, what does he know? You know what I'm saying? And I said, all right, well, well I'll do what he says. Yeah. I did what he said, and thank goodness I did. Yeah. He was dead on, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, let me tell you, um, so, so you, you know, before this interview, I went, we have two trumpet players. I keep looking, I don't have to look. We have two trumpet players who work here, good trumpet, excellent trumpet players. And I said, you know, tell me, I, you know, tell me what I should ask Bill. Man. And both of them, would, for their own sake, wanted you to talk about like your daily routine. Also heard this is what I hit, heard from them as well. I mean, I know this. I know he was a player. That that uh, they said Bill, you know, he has such a great sound and control, and and he has the high notes, but he owns the high notes, but he doesn't necessarily want to be a lead player. So uh, I so, learned that out of necessity. Uh, if you're going to be a professional trumpet player, you know, there's a lot of wedding bands, rock bands type things that I was involved in through the years. You had to have some high notes. Yeah. If you're going to work. You right. had to have some high notes. Yeah. So the daily routine. To this day, my daily routine is, uh, well, I should say right now, it's, um, I start with uh, lip slurs, lip flexibilities, I don't know how you want to call them. You know, I, do, I go through uh, the Arvin's book, and I go through that whole slur section, the whole thing. So it takes about maybe a half hour to slurs. Then I'll go to the intervals, and um, that'll take about a half hour. I'll do every page in the, in the Arvin's book, the intervals. Um, and I'll try to slow those down, speed them up, depending on the tempo. Then I'll go to uh, articulation. I started doing just recently. I decided I need to work more on articulation. So I go into the single tonguing exercises in the Arvin's book, and I do that. That's one day. Uh, that's the first um, practice session of the day for me. So that's an hour and a half. About an hour and a half right there. You know, Of course, I've got my daughter now, so I can get maybe a half hour tend to her half hour, so it's not all in a row, it's broken up. Yeah. Uh, later on at night, you know, when my wife's home from teaching, she, my wife's a tremendous bass player. She is. Genevieve Rose, yeah. yeah. Um, when she comes home, you know, she spends time with our daughter at that point, I, I work on my jazz things. And what I'm working on for jazz now is intervals, 
I can demonstrate this. Uh, doing intervals and patterns, am I describing this correctly? So right now I'm going to do my... So it's just steps, you know, but it's, you know, D, E flat, E, yeah. F, and now do it that way. Uh, like that. Or, so then I'll go... You know, I'll go through a blues progression. That was a quick blues progression. Yeah. One, four, five, then the three, six, two, five. And that was just uh, steps. Then I'll go through um, minor thirds, major thirds, I'll do just in a whole tone. Then I'm up to fourths, and I'll run that to the 12 keys. Um, you know. So, 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 what were you playing? Tell me what you were playing again. And the other thing, I learned this from George Garzon was um, his. Um, the triadic thing? Yeah, but uh, he talked about chromaticism, chromaticism in, be in between. So, cool, so I, I kind of expanded that. And basically everything was built off the of minor third. I heard him say that one day in class. So the three, six, two, five, it's just all minor third. You know, it's well, just minor third. Play it third. slow so we can trans so they can oh. Because uh, I just wanted my fingers to go to a different place. Yeah. So I noticed when I take solos and gigs, none of that comes out. It will though. I, it but will. I've been doing that for years. Yeah. For I, years. I feel the same way, man. I'm doing you know? things. You know, like... But I'm happy with it because I know that my technique is, you know, as far as getting around the horn and, and being a, to, um, uh, what's the word, uh, to do what I'm trying to do on the horn is, is really there now. You know, it's really starting to happen. And uh, you know, between the third finger and the, and the first two fingers, you know, there's some stuff going on in there that's really, you know, coordinating itself really yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I'm working it's on endless, jazz wise. Right? Endless, 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 right? Yeah, it is endless. You know, so uh, again, so those are all intervals that I run through a blues progression. So I end up playing in every key. Yeah. And I do that every day, and I do it to the metronome. I make sure I'm using the metronome. Yeah, I'm a big metronome guy. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. as far as, uh, you know, when I start to play over a tune, I was telling young Adam out there that um, I learned from Shu to put the metronome on one and three rather than two and four because the chord changes fall on one and three, and so your line goes like this, nice and smooth, yeah. you know, rather that's, than choppy. And, and Shu told me you do that at first, you know, to get your line smooth, but I never progressed beyond it. I loved it so much, I kept it on one and three. I like it on one. You, know yeah. you know what I like is one. Yeah, I heard Remember. Gary Burton say one is, you know, everything's yeah. one. That's what, the, that's what yeah. Joey Lovato is like, uh, one of his, I, I, I probably misquoted him, he said, you know, we talk about, they talk about two and four and mm -hmm. one and three, he goes, he goes, if you don't, if there's no one, you, if you don't, you can't find one, two's yeah. gone. Yeah, yeah, it's gone. Two, you know? yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I, I've been enjoying it. What else you got on your notes? Okay, yeah, so, we agree on that then. All right, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, influences. Uh, influences. Oh, influences. We talk. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And of course, my parents. You know, I came home from fourth grade and told my mother I want to play a trumpet. She put me in the car right then and there, and took me to store, uh, and got me a trumpet. So yeah. I mean, mom and dad. You know. Yeah. And like I said, always there for everything. Oh so man, there's Bill's, influence one. <laughs> Bill's, Bill's mom is like, you know, I've been, you know, with him for twenty years on these gigs, off and on. But every time. Yeah. She's always there, man. She's yeah. the sweetest lady. You know? Always there, yeah. as always. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's you know the biggest influences. But and then uh, you know when I heard Man in Ferguson for the first time, this is before I wanted to really pursue jazz. I just could not believe that was a trumpet. Yeah. What? Yeah. So that was yeah. an influence yeah, that changed yeah. my life. And then Clifford Brown changed it forever for good. Yeah. You know, I already told that yeah. story. And now Tom Harrell and. Of course, you know, I'm also influenced by, you know, the, um, all the classics. Kenny Dorham, I used to, it was a period of just, I couldn't get oh, enough Kenny, Kenny Dorham yeah. and, and Lee Morgan and, and Freddie Hubbard. You know, the guys who made music. Yeah, you know, Miles. And Louis, Louis Armstrong, too, you yeah. know. So, you know, the history is there, too. But sure. today, I'm, um, I just completed a CD, a new CD to, of uh, my original music. But I'm saying that for this reason. Uh, Tom Reynolds has a song called Let the Children Play. And the melody is basically two notes. I was like, what? 
two notes. It sounds like the background of a pop song. The horn's doing this, you know, behind yeah. the singer. That's the tune. Yeah. So I wrote a tune, and we're talking about influence here, on my new CD, which is basically, I've expanded that to other keys, so it's just not that. But it's basically two notes. Buddy. It's almost like, you know, what was it? Whatever that is. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it's just the first two notes. Or, you know, going through a different progression. Then the bridge, it does a little, little, little something different there. But... Tom Harrell's writing is a huge influence on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So also, Bill, I just I just have to say this. Bill, Bill has a, the most beautiful little daughter that's just like the yeah. cutest thing. Ever. I wrote a song for me. Want to hear? It? Yeah, I do. Do you want to yeah. hear it now? Look, you want to talk about your? <laughs> I do want to hear it. But you want to talk about the Nashville? Well, you tell Nashville. Yeah, we second it. second CD. Second CD. Uh, it's going to be out on uh, Jeff Coffin's label, Ear Up Records. It's right now, it's all been recorded, uh, it still needs to be mixed, so it's real new. Um, there's a ballad that the strings are being put on that I'm very, oh, very yeah, happy very, about, you yeah. know, so that's being recorded probably right now as we speak. They're putting the strings on the Nashville String Machine. Um, Chris McDonald did the orchestration, he's a, just a wonderful uh, string arranger and writer down in Nashville. Uh, so yeah, um, that'll be on. Ear Up Records, a Jeff Coffin label. And um, I'm very happy with the songs. There are eight originals. And some of them I developed here at David French Music Company. Uh, I'd have students who would come in and they'd want to improvise. And so I would start you know, working on a progression that I would enjoy playing over. And I would play it for the kids to see their reaction. And you know, some of them would just go, wow, that's fun, man. That's oh, great. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm on to something here, you know? That's so crazy. that's how I write. I, I find a chord progression that, that I myself would enjoy soloing over. Yeah. You know, I was told once that melody dictates harmony, but I seem to write backwards. Yeah, you know, yeah. I come up with a harmony and then I come up with a bass line before I get a melody. Yeah. You know, then I gotta make the melody fit over what yeah. you know I want to play over. So that's really it's interesting to, it's interesting to, to hear that because that uh, uh, the old Broadway cats, you know, that wrote all that stuff, you know, all those great you know, you know they all they all started at different Places. Some of them would do the melody, and yeah. and it, and they there would be no yeah. harmony, and then the reverse was true. You know? Yeah, I, and I I don't know which one. Well, wherever it comes from, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I learned from Victor Wooten hanging around with Jeff Coffin, who was with the Flectones. You know, I you know, was very fortunate to hang around Victor Wooten a little bit. You know, he really emphasizes the groove. Yeah, like a groove. Now, whether that groove is swinging or whatever it is, it's got to be in the pocket, and that really makes a song come to life. Yeah. You know, in my opinion. Well, sure. again, this is all my opinion. What we're talking about right. here. And so my songs, a lot of them are groove oriented now. Well, you it's know? like the, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like the rhythm of life. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's, so that's you know. that's where I, uh, you know, uh, aspire to yeah. get that happening too. A major yeah. part of it. If it's yeah. not, if, you know, if I rehearse the band and I don't feel the groove, it's just all right. Then this song is not working. Let's move on. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So how long did it take? That how long were you in the studio for? Two days. Oh yeah. Two days. Two good full days. Two full days. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and the, uh, you've told me already that you just love it. You just I do. I love. It. I'm just great. thrilled with the way it came out. Oh, I'm just great, thrilled man. about it. Yeah. You know? Well, maybe we should listen to something. Wait a minute. Let me let me see what's going on. Yeah. Daily warm up. We did that. Yeah. Oh, practice! What you're practicing now? Who are you listening to? Uh, well, I listen to a lot of. Um, I wait for anything new from that Tom Harold's on. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. but I listen to all all cats that are out there. I hear a lot of world music from Jeff when we go out on the road. You know, he's yeah. always got this and that. And, and, you know, and yeah. So I listen to a lot of different things. You know, maybe just one time because we're in the van traveling to a gig. You know, but I'm always listening to something new. Tom like, Harrell, man, I think Tom Harrell is the vanguard, like, like he's in real there. soon, like with I think with Joey. Every year he gets into the vanguard. He spends like two months there. They bring him in for like for different ve different venues. Uh, yeah, it's just like wow, he's, he's, such a beast. Beast. Yeah, he's a beast. Yeah, he's another one. I was on a, years ago yeah. talking about turning around the bands. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, and I I was on this. I was on Larry Elgar's bands for like, ye ye years and and it, you know, and we used to, everyone would come in with cars. So you wouldn't come in on a bus. Yeah. You'd meet the duck. You know, and they were, we had regulars, but I remember, you know, I don't, I forget the name, the, I think it was Muscat Ramble who played. And uh -huh. this guy played the solo, and was like, whoa, yeah, and yeah. they always thought He's a head turner. I met Tom one time in St. Louis, I went to see him, yeah. and I was so excited, I was yeah. living in Nashville. I drove to St. Louis, you know, and I got there early, because I wanted to get a seat, I mean, early. I'm the only one in the club. The good news is I got the front row seat. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I sat there the whole time, and I watched him, I was just in heaven, watching this guy play right in front of me, you know. And at the end of the night, I'm waiting. 
and I'm waiting for him to come out in the back room. You know, and everyone has left. Again, I'm the only one in the club, and he hasn't left yet. Finally, he comes strolling out, you know, and he's got some issues, health issues. So he's moving slow, and I come up behind him, and I say, Hey, Mr. Harrell, I introduce myself. Can I walk you to wherever you're going? You know, where are you going? He's just walking out into the street. So I walked him out in the street and walked with him. He was going to his hotel room, and he kind of has problem articulating sometimes, you know. So he's talking slow, and it's kind of like, I'm going over here real soft and everything. I said, well, Mr. Harold, before I let you go, I, I need to ask you a trumpet question, man. This is a, when you uh, play outside the chord changes, you know, how do you approach this? And something just went, his brain just went, he just stood up straight and he goes, there's two ways you can go about it. And he just, he turned into a completely different person, yeah, you know? Well, uh, so, yeah. yeah. And, but anyway, the answer to that question was, he said intuitively, you know, so he doesn't think about a scale. I'm going out here to this scale, right, you know. Right. And I understand that Phil Woods called him. You know, he said to him about him. He said when he goes plays outside the court change, it's so beautiful you don't know he went outside. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, that's, that's enough of that. So uh, yeah, let's 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 hear some. some All right. So I wrote. This is the only song on the new CD that is straight ahead. Um, it might take a second to. No. So I wrote this for my daughter. Oh, nice. It's called Jeanette's Tune. about influences, uh, it's one, Jeff Coffin's one of his tunes, went back and forth between major one and four major, one, four. And I love that tune so much, I love playing on it. This is an expanded, it. so it's three different keys, or four different keys, it goes one, four, one, four, back to one, four, one, four, and a different key, one, four, one, four, with a, a sharp five in there every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Just, that was an influence. His, his writing has influenced my writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. So maybe we should say goodbye to these people. You don't want to hear the trumpet song? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I do. <laughs> wait a minute. No, excuse me. <laughs> I think I'm next. Chris Walters, yeah. Chris 
Clint, piano player plays some Jeff, so I'm as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And he was Bobby Mandrill's uh, oh, musical oh, director. Yeah, wow. And he was Alabama's piano player for decades. So what are you going on? Was, was Jeff still doing that stuff? Not with the Mutet. He's going on with Dave Matthews. So. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. busy with that. But, you know, I'm sure you'll be out there again. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've been on stage with Dave Matthews. I, right. I was very fortunate to sit in in that situation, and uh, it's a little overwhelming to be honest with you to step out on stage and see all those people, but I imagine you get used to it, yeah. I'd like to get used to it. <laughs> no, oh, it was great. Yeah. It was great. The band, all those guys, fabulous, very supportive. Yeah. Dave is a sweetheart. That's right, yeah. yeah. And George got out there, too, I heard. Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. Jeff got George out there, yeah. too, yeah. 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 That's Jeff Hoffman. He's yeah. a sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. That's great. All right, so we're going to say goodbye to y'all now. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you so much.